hi welcome to this session and this session we are discussing the module for the uh, series on cardiology that we did the 40 questions that's what i'm going to discuss so this is for the discussion on module 1 with the answers and their explanation and concept building that's the whole idea that's going to be so the first question was about not a feature of orthostatic hypotension now this is a question which has come directly from the basics and as i had divided the module 1 to it three in the respective categories that we had discussed that we'll be covering clinical examination as a part of module one. So a lot of questions was from there. And as you know, that that's a big proportion of questions that are asked uh, from that section. So orthostatic hypotension, as you know, is defined by fall uh, in systolic blood pressure more than 20 or diastolic more than 10 in response to upright posture. Uh, the second option that was given, however, is not correct. It was that mentioned here that is the fall is noted within 30 seconds of stand, uh, standing. We all know that it is exaggerated in advanced age, that is elderly, dehydrated patients, certain foods and uh, diuretics or the vasodilators. And they may not always there be a compensatory tachycardia because physiologically speaking, when a patient gets hypotension, to maintain the cardiac output, there'll be reflex tachycardia. But not all patients may be able to mount a significant amount of orthostatic uh, hypotension induced uh, response to rise in the rate and that's why it it is also a correct statement so a lot of you got confused between b and c but the right answer is b because as you know the definition uh, of, of fall is noted uh, is within three minutes so it's a long duration you may not have orthostatus within half a minute orthostatic this is from the textbook harrison's textbook of cardiology as you can see here it says now, from the page 1818, that the orthostatic hypotension is defined by systolic fall of more than 20, diastolic more than 10, in response to assumption of upright posture from supine within 3 minutes, not 30 seconds. And there may also be lack of compensatory tachycardia, abnormal response that suggests autonomic insufficiency, as may be seen in patients with diabetes or Parkinson's disease. Orthostatic hypotension is common cause of postural lightheadedness and syncope and should be assured routinely and assessed routinely in patients when new diag this diagnosis might pertain. It can be exaggerated in advanced age, certain medication, food deconditioning, humidity and ambient temperature. So that was question number one. That brings us to discussion again on a clinical examination question, which was a question on dynamic auscultation. So as you know, patient features of dynamic auscultation, there is a very crit uh, critical discussion. And this is very often that one or the other time, one or the other question would prop up in dynamic auscultation. Uh, this was about MVP and HOCM. Uh, in patients of MVP, the click and the mur murmur move further to the first heart sound with squatting. Uh, and HOCM, however, behaves, uh, was, was mentioned opposite to the murmur of MVP becoming louder and longer with squat. Third option was MVP associated murmur becomes louder on squatting and HOCM becomes longer and louder on rapid standing. Now you have to remember a dictum for HOCM MVP on dynamic auscultation. That is all murmurs decrease on standing in Valsalva except HOCM and MVP. So that goes on to explain what happens. Basically to explain, it is all dependent on the LV preload and the afterload. Whenever the LV cavity becomes bigger in any dynamic condition, the bigger cavity would reduce the obstruction and reduce the prolapse of MVP. So MVP goes, uh, the, 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 the prolapse decreases, the obstruction of the LV outflowing decreases because of the enlarged LV cavity, the SAM decreases and as the LVOT obstruction decreases. So whenever the LV condition, LV uh, OT cavity is larger, which means there is increase either afterload or increase either preload, the murmur of both HOCM and MVP will decrease. So, the, as I said, all murmurs except MVP and HOCM decrease on standing in Valsalva. So, the option B is the one that is not true because uh, squatting is associated with abrupt increase in LV preload and afterload, whereas rapid standing results in sudden decrease in preload. In patients with MVP, the click and the murmur move away from the first start sound uh, with squatting because of the delay in the onset of prolapse. And with rapid standing, the click moves closer to the first heart as prolapse occur earlier in Sicily to a smaller chamber dimension. The murmur of HOCM behaves similarly, becoming softer and shorter with squatting with a 95% sensitivity and 85% specificity and longer and louder on standing with again 95% sensitivity and 84% specificity as mentioned on page number 1823 uh, of Harrison's 21st edition. So this explains again that the option B was incorrect for this question. 
uh, this was a question that was framed uh, from one of the uh, textbook questions again uh, from the our own MCQ pattern we had asked this time because we wanted it to be repeated in the sense that it's an important topic to understand dynamic auscultation. And this is the table from Harrison, which says uh, right-sided uh, 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 murmurs, uh, in generally speaking with respiration, they increase with respiration because anything which increases the right-sided flow will increase. So only right-sided sound that decreases uh, on inspiration is basically pulmonary ejection click because uh, uh, of the valve now getting, because of the increased venous return, valve now have is lifted up and has to move from a position uh, which is slightly already up. And we discussed the Valsalva here uh, to some extent that the most murmur decrease in length and in intensity, that exceptions being HOCM uh, uh, and usually becoming louder and that of MVP becoming longer and offer louder. After release of Valsalva, right-sided murmurs tend to decrease and control intensity earlier than the other two-sided murmurs. So the for the after premature beats or atrial fibrillation, uh, when a long cycle follows a short cycle, again, the dynamic auscultation will change accordingly. Murmurs originating at the normal or the stenotic semilunar valve will increase in the cardiac cycle after a premature beat or in the cycle after a long cycle length in the AF. On the contrary, systolic murmurs due to regurgitation, they will not change. So murmur of MR does not change. Murmur of atrial aortic stenosis will increase because of the uh, 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 the ischemic, the premature beat will lead to some release of a calcium, which will further strengthen the force with which the contraction of the next ensuing cycle will take place. And hence, the force of contraction will be more in the subsequent uh, beat. And this would lead to a louder and a more longer murmur of aortic stenosis. So after VPB, AS murmur is louder, but that of the MR will not change in intensity. Again, we discussed about the positional change in the uh, uh, when we were discussing this question that withstanding most murmurs diminish with two exceptions being HOCM, which becomes louder and MVP, which lengthens and is often intensified with squatting. Most become louder, uh, but those of HCB, uh, uh, HOCM and MVP, they often soften and disappear while passive leg raising usually will produce the same result, especially more on the right side on the tricuspid valve because of the more blood coming to the right heart. And then you'll be having in situation a murmur of TR and MS, uh, TS, especially uh, immediately post two to three beats of leg raising or abdominal compression for that matter. Again, withstanding, most murmur will diminish with two exceptions being HOCM as we discussed. Exercise murmurs due to blood flow across normal obstructed valve become louder with both isotonic and submaximal isometric. Murmurs of MR, VSD, AR also will increase with the hand grip because of the increase in the afterload and hence the regurgitation will increase and hence the murmur, however, of the HCM will decrease because of this, the LV size becomes louder. So left-sided S4 and S3 sounds are often accentuated by exercise, particularly that of ischemic heart disease. Now that brings us to question number three. This was which of the following is correct about patients presenting with murmur? So what you should do for a patient who comes with a murmur to you, uh, majority murmurs are diastolic, which is incorrect. As you know, majority murmurs are systolic, uh, often innocent murmurs, which can be soft, short systolic. Short systolic murmurs are more common in young children is correct. Echocardiography is not advisable for all. Only in pathologically suspected murmurs, you need to see uh, and identify uh, as to what the cause of murmur is. So all murmurs don't require echocardiography. All continuous murmurs are also not pathological because we know uh, murmurs like memory shuffle or for that matter, physiological AV fistulas uh, or even uterine fistulas or AV fistula or collaterals may give rise to murmurs that may not be pathological, though they are continuous. So majority murmurs are mid-systolic and soft grade 1 to 2. When such a murmur occurs in asymptomatic child or young adult without other evidence on exam, it's usually benign and echo is generally not required. By contrast, 2D and color Doppler, uh, as mentioned in chapter 241, are indicated with loud murmurs, which is more than grade 3, or holodiastolic or late systolic, and in most patients with diastolic or continuous murmur. But continuous murmur need not always be pathological, as I mentioned, mammal esophageal being one of the murmurs that is physiological. The next question, number four, was about 
which of the following is correct about exercise and cardiac output again uh, this is from basic pathophysiology of cardiovascular system hyperventilation the pumping action of the exercising muscle and venoconstriction during exercise all augment venous return and hence increase the ventricular filling and preload is correct so this we know that how hyperventilation will in change the intrathoracic pressure pumping action of the peripheral muscle they are also called as peripheral heart and venoconstriction during exercise will all be responsible for augmenting the venous return and increase the ventricular filling and preload so there are uh, this is the correct option amongst the four options given here uh, option a was correct uh, the other options were incorrect there are only two determinants of stroke volume preload after load no that's not correct we'll see why what else is vasoconstriction ensues in the exercising muscle limiting the increase in the preload and otherwise uh, would occur as a cardiac output rises to as high as 20 times greater than maximum and vasodilatation ultimately does not contribute to elevated cardiac output no it does so those three options were incorrect this is uh, from the chapter on page 1808 and there is a figure of 237.7 the integrated response to exercise illustrates typical interaction among the three determinants of stroke volume so there, as i mentioned option b was incorrect the third determinant being the contractility so preload after load and contractility hyperventilation the pumping action of exercising muscle the venoconstriction during exercise all will augment venous return and hence ventricular filling and preload simultaneously the increase in urine and hormonal adrenergic stimulation of myocardium and tachycardia that occur during exercise they will augment the myocardial contractility as you can see from the curves that are given uh, a, a one and two together with the elevating stroke volume and st uh, stroke work with little or no change in end diastolic pressure volume vasodilatation occurring in exercising muscle thus limiting uh the increase in the afterload that otherwise would occur as cardiac output rises to levels as high as five times not 20 times than the basal normal so this vasodilatation allows the achievement of uh, uh cardiac output during exercise and arterial pressure only moderately higher than the resting state and hence the other three statements were incorrect the next one is this chart uh, this figure which was there uh, in again in harrison we've been discussing this a lot of times in our revision quick revision strategy also we have seen this this is a pressure volume relationship of lv and we just to understand physio pathophysiology this has been uh, posted from harrison again to ask as to what are the, uh, the condition where you have this type of ele elevated filling pressure so when you look at this pressure volume curve you can see that the basic filling pressures have gone up it's gone up the volumes and the pressure when you look this is a relatively stiff ventricle so though for the same values it has to fill up much higher and this is happening not because of the uh, 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 inability of ventricle to fill but it's being restricted by a restraint from outside force which is the pericardial restraint so the options that were given here for this diagram were impaired relaxation increased ventricular stiffness pericardial restraint and chamber dilatation and the answer was pericardium so the mechanism that caused diastolic dis uh, dysfunction reflected by the pressure volume relationship you can see the loop how is it depicted uh, the normal one and the broken line being the diastolic dysfunction uh, this is from the uh, uh, at the level of myocardial contractility lv and diastolic volume varies inversely with end systolic pressure as contractility declines and systolic volume rises invasive measurement of end systolic lv pressure volume loops adds rigor to research studies of lv function integrated cardiopulmonary exercise uh, uh, testing is now more broadly available but these techniques are less pragmatic than the more readily assessed indices obtained in routine practice such as volumes and reduction ejection fraction so this is the picture from uh, harrison that uh, we have seen uh, multiple times on page 1809 uh, this is how the abnormal relaxation would be so the the filling would happen in a patient with stiff chamber at much higher uh, uh, volume pressure curve while the dilatation would shift the curve to the lateral aspect while the restraint would only lift line up the baseline so this is classical pericardial restraint here um, and the, the dilatation will have shift while stiff ventricle will have uh, abnormal uh, filling at the higher pressure while abnormal 
uh, relaxation would have higher pressure in the initial phase. So this is the figure 23712 from Harrison explaining this relationship and the correct explanation for the question.